Hello and welcome back to this extra episode in the Parser Combinators from Scratch series. Today we're going to be looking at some cool tricks we can do with the chain method that will let us create an async await like construct for parsers. And what exactly do I mean by that? Well, first let's consider a single promise returning function. I'll call it after. And it will take a time in milliseconds and a value and basically just resolve with that value after that number of milliseconds. And of course, how we could actually use that would be something like this. So if we wanted to get three values coming in over time, all depending on each other, and then do something with all of them, then this starts to get a little bit uncomfortable. Here we're getting two values and deciding what the third value will be, depending on what those first two were. And in fact, this starts to look like the Pyramid of Doom, also known as Callback Hell. Now, luckily for us, in the modern world, async await exists, so we can rewrite this in a more sequential, flatter way using an async function. And I think most people would agree that the async version is much clearer. But what does this have to do with parsing? Well, let's imagine we have a similarly dependent structure, like statements in an imaginary programming language. Now, variable declarations in this language, they might start with like a var keyword or a global var keyword, followed by a name, then followed by a specific type like an int or a string or a boolean, and finally followed by a specific value. I'll go ahead and say that this looks like a horrible syntax, but ignoring that, there are quite a few ways that you could go about passing this kind of data structure. One way that will probably initially seem quite weird could be that we first pass the var or the global var keyword with a choice. And when we have that, we can chain the result without actually caring what it is right now, and then choose to pass the next data as just letters, which is just our variable name. Then we can again chain with a choice of our types. And then we could chain the result of that, extracting the type, and finally start doing something with the data. So if we have an int, we'll just pass that with digits. If we have a string, we can get a sequence of a quote mark, then some letters, then another quote mark, and then we'll take all of that and we'll map the result just to extract the data. And if we have a bool, then it's just a choice between being true or false in a string. And if this was a real situation, then we should absolutely be handling the case where it's none of those. But uh, for now, we're just going to move past that and say that it will always be these three. So when we've gotten all of that at the end, we could just use map to put all the information back together into a nice object that represents this whole statement. But what you'll notice is that because chain actually consumes the type, we've lost access to that variable at this point. And since we need to record that in our final object, we're going to need to somehow get it back. So what we can do is we can map all of the parsers that get individual data types and return an array that has, you know, first the data and then the type all bundled nicely together. Then we can destructure that in our map and get our data and our type and everything can be inside our object. Just like before, this isn't actually really very nice code. It's very much looking like a pyramid of doom, which is definitely not easy to follow. But as you may astutely observe, our chain method is actually quite a bit like a promises.then method. So in the example from before, we called dot then on a promise and we got access to its result and we ended up returning a new promise, which in the end was flattened out to a single result. Now, when we call chain on a parser, we get access to the result and we end up returning a new parser. So let's imagine that we had a special kind of function like an async await, but for parsers and we'll rewrite our pyramid. So instead of the async keyword, we might actually say something like contextual, since this is a special parser where the results of all of that complicated nesting is our context. And now we can just basically await our declaration type, our var name and our type, but we'll use our own special keyword for that. We'll use parse. And just like everything in an async function would have access to the value of a promise that's been awaited, 
we'll say that everything in our contextual function has access to the passing result after it's been passed. That means that now we can just make a variable called data and we can use a few if statements to pass correctly based on the type. And since all of that data is available to us in the function as variables, we don't need to do any strange mapping to carry the type and the data around. In the end, we can just return an object with all of the values we've collected. And just like that, we've tamed our callback pyramid into a flat readable piece of code in which all the dependencies between the different passing results are very clear. But unfortunately in JavaScript, short of writing a Babel plugin, we can't actually add new keywords or function types to the language. But luckily for us, we also don't need to do that because JavaScript already has an extremely underutilized feature that we can use to create this system, and that is the generator function. Now, I talked about generator functions extensively in the creating promises from scratch in a post-apocalyptic future two-parter where we built a promise implementation from scratch and then our own async await. And I strongly recommend that you go and watch those two as well, because this is all essentially the same underlying technique. There is a link on the screen and in the description for that. But very briefly, a generator function is a special function which can yield many values. So I'll just comment out all this code for now and write a very simple generator function. First, we'll yield a string hello. Then we'll yield the number one, two, three. Then we'll yield an array of numbers. And finally, we'll just return a string at the end since this is a function as well. And when we actually run a generator function, what we get back is something called an iterator. And iterators are very simple, but very powerful little objects that have a few methods. And the main one being the next method. When we call next on the iterator, what we get back is an object with a yielded value and an indicator of whether or not we're done iterating. So if I log out a few calls to iterator.next, what you'll see is that all of those values end up coming out of the generator, including the return value. And then along with the return value, we see that the done variable is set to true, meaning there are no more values to be yielded. And any other calls to next after that just get undefined as a value, and done is always true. Now, interestingly, when we call next, the generator function runs all the code up to a yield, then it pauses, and it doesn't start running again until we call next again. And even more interestingly, if we pass in a value to our next function, the whole previous yield expression gets the value that we passed in. To illustrate this, we can assign all of our yields to variables and we can log out their values. If we change our calls to next to pass values in, we'll see that they do indeed get logged out. Now this is really, really powerful because it gives us an asynchronous communication between the generator function and whatever code outside is calling next on the iterator that it created. The outside code can sort of interpret what comes out of the generator in a very specific way and do something with the values and then pass the computed results back into the generator function. Again, I went into quite a lot of detail about how this works in the promise and async videos, so really make sure to check those out. But for now, let's get rid of all of this stuff and let's replace our imaginary contextual uh, function with a generator function instead. So what I'll do is I'll change this contextual keyword into being a function call called contextual, which we'll actually write later. Then the inner function is gonna become a generator function and we indicate that with function star. And then finally, all the pass keywords will become yields. So this is actually what our function will be. This is our async await, but for passes. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go above and we're gonna to start to write this contextual function. So it's gonna take a generator function and in the end, it's gonna return a fully fledged parser that can be used just like any other parser object. So that's actually the first thing we can do inside. We're gonna return succeed uh, which is essentially a way of us uh, creating a parser that has a value inside it already. And it doesn't actually matter what we put inside this because we're immediately going to call chain and throw away the value. Then we're going to get an iterator out of the generator function. It's really important that we do this inside the parser and not outside before we return the parser because iterators are very stateful. And we want to be able to use the same parsers many, many different times. The second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a function called run step, which is gonna take a next value. And this is where all the magic is gonna happen. 
At every step of the iterator, we're going to get a yielded parser from the generator. And on the next step, we're going to feed it back the value of that parser, the, the parsed result. And the result of this entire call to chain is going to be a single call to run the step with an undefined next value. Because if you haven't yielded any parsers yet, you can't actually give the value of a parser. OK, so let's actually write the run step function. We ask the iterator for a result and we check if we're already done. If we are, that's great. We can just return the final value of the function, which you'll remember isn't actually a parser, but just like a regular value. In our case, it's an object. And we'll wrap all of that up in a succeed because we need to return a parser from this. And if we're not done, then we know that what we have inside iterator result dot value should actually be a parser. So we'll put that in a variable with a sensible name. But we should also probably check that it really is a parser and throw an error if it's not. Otherwise, we're in for some nasty bugs when we use this library. And for that, we can use instance of. Now that we're sure it's a parser and chain requires us to return a parser, all of those types are now sort of properly aligned. What we can do is we can return our parser, but then immediately call chain again and pass that the run step function. You might need to read that code a couple of times for that to make sense. But basically what we're doing is creating a recursive loop that only ends when the generator is out of values, when there's no more yielded values to come. And just notice that the function inside chain, which is run step, it actually receives the passed result as a next value. And that's automatically fed back into the generator when we call next. That's what actually allows the generator function to access the result. And one of the really beautiful things about this is that if the parser ever doesn't match, because it's just a different kind of text and this isn't the correct parser for it, then the internal parser state is going to get set to an error. And you'll recall that whenever map or chain are called when a parser state is an error, they simply pass along that error. So errors are going to propagate through our contextual parser without us ever needing to specify anything about it. How cool is that? All right, let's actually give our contextual parser that we wrote before a try to see if we get the expected results. And indeed, you'll see that it does work exactly as expected. So that's how we can create async await like flows with our parsers. This technique can make writing complicated parsers a breeze, but it should be used with some thought. Often simpler parsers like sequence of with a map at the end will tend to do the job just as well and probably in a much clearer way. So if in doubt, just think about the name, contextual. If you don't have to build up any context and make decisions about that context, then this technique might actually just be overkill. Thanks for watching, and thanks to all the patrons of Low Level JavaScript. Your support, input, and enthusiasm is what keeps this channel going. If you want to support this channel too, you can do that by going to patreon.com forward slash low level JavaScript for as little as just a dollar an episode. And if you can't do that, then just watching and recommending the channel to friends and co-workers is more than enough. I'll see you next time.